So good morning everyone. Welcome to our Women in Wholesale Breakfast Briefing. Today we're talking about menopause. I can't believe that one in 10 women in the UK quit their jobs because they don't get enough support in the workplace with their menopausal symptoms. So today we're really lucky to have Cathy Abernethy, a highly qualified and experienced menopause specialist. She's been the uh, founding member and former chair of the British Menopause Society. Um, Cathy will also be joined by Molly Wilmot, who's going to talk us through PEPI and all the benefits that it offers. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat or put your hand up if you'd like to share your questions verbally. Um, and if you have any confidential questions that you prefer not to have included in the recording, please save them till the end. So over to you, Cathy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting us today. And uh, let me just get my presentation going. So uh, thank you for the introduction. I spend my whole life talking about menopause. Um, that is my my passion, if you like, to encourage women to find out about the options that they have, what they can expect around the time of the menopause, and also what people can do to support people going through the menopause, both at work and at home. So I sit on the NICE guideline group. I'm on the British Menopause Society, which is a professional organisation. And I come alongside people individually and corporately to help um, manage their menopause symptoms. You can't really have failed to notice that menopause is big business at the moment. And also it's very topical, both for the government and in society. Just around probably six or seven years ago, you wouldn't have found a single company or organisation with a menopause policy. And now probably around 20% of organisations will have a policy and some will have um, guidance and many will have more informal arrangements. Government themselves have also taken this um, and very seriously and they have now had in 2021, we had the um, Equalities Commission, the, the Equal Parties um, discussions around menopause. Carolyn Harris was leading that in the Labour Party and we've had the menopause mandate. We have marches now to Parliament um, and it's interesting for me as a healthcare professional because actually it wasn't until individuals themselves and women themselves sort of took on the armour, if you like, and decided is enough, enough, enough is enough, we need to do something about this, that we saw the big change. Those of us who were working in menopause for a long time had been trying to raise the profile, but actually it was people like Davina McCall, uh, Mariella Frostrup, and the millions of women themselves who came alongside and said, we've got to do something. So you probably saw the Davina documentaries, and I'll be wondering actually if anyone's willing to come off um, mute and just tell us what they thought about the documentaries and their experience of it or what they've heard about it or pop it in the chat did anybody see it there were two actually there were two menopause ones uh, one was primarily around um, the experience of menopause symptoms at work and then the second one was a little bit more around sex and menopause they were very popular and they were um, screened on Channel 4. You can probably still see them if you've not seen them already. Someone saw it. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Yes. And one of the things that it really did was got the conversation going. Um, menopause had been um, spoken about behind closed doors. It had been spoken about maybe in Parliament, but Davina got people talking about it in the everyday living rooms and in the workplace as well, um, including Davina's book, Jennifer. Yes, thank you. Um, so we are talking about menopause much, much more than we ever did, and that has to be good. That does bring with it, though, the fact that whenever you have a lobby of people discussing any issue, you have polarised views. So we do have the polarisation of menopause as well. So those people who feel that it's a medical condition, and it should be treated as such, and those who believe that it's a natural transition and should be treated as that. And actually, I think somewhere in the middle is probably right. And I'd love to know your ideas on that. And we can talk about that as we go through. So because of that conversation and because women themselves are no longer silent and quite rightly so, and healthcare professionals are encouraging people to talk to their managers and to their employers if their symptoms are affecting them, this is putting pressure on employers as well. And it's not just menopause. We know that the whole gender issue um, in workplaces is huge. It's, it isn't just the menopause issue. It's also the pension equality issue. It's the gender pay gap. Um, it's the... Um, the Me Too movement, if you like, has affected people as one. Well. Alongside of that is the menopause discussion. And I think it's as the gender discussion has increased, it's partly the reason that menopause has increased with it. Um, and that can only be good. 
Um, Elizabeth said, yes, yeah, she finds it slightly frustrating because uh, she mentioned how men suffered with menopause. I mean, I'd have a quick comment about men's menopause. The men's menopause or andropause um, is quite different from that experienced by women with ovaries because if you're born with ovaries, you will inevitably have the menopause, whereas the men's experience, andropause, is more of a medical condition and not everybody will experience it. Everyone will experience low testosterone, but they won't all feel bad as a result of it. So we worked with um, REBA, the uh, Rewards and Employee Benefits Association, and we looked at some of the priorities that companies and organisations were setting themselves for the following year. And lots of these are gender related. So attracting and, reta and retaining female talent, increasing leadership positions um, with women in leadership, etc. And you can see this. So this is part of the discussion. Menopause is, you know, we, we sort of here to talk about menopause, but we have to put it in context that it is just part of a wider discussion. So at Pepe, uh, we've been doing this for quite a while now, and I've certainly been doing menopause now for over 30 years, which makes me feel quite old. Um, and we do have some learnings from that. One is that policies are great. And as I said, six or seven years ago, there would have been no menopause policies. But, you know, policies can sometimes have the tendency to just sit on the shelf or in the modern day, sit in a file somewhere electronically and not actually be referred to. So the policies can be written or guidance if you prefer not to have an actual policy, but they have to be backed by action. And if the employers, uh, employees rather, your team colleagues don't know that there's a policy, then it's not being effective. It's also time that we stopped describing menopause as being a women's issue. Um, it's not. It's an issue that affects everybody and women may experience it more directly, but actually it will affect everybody both at home and at work. So, you know, you either experience it individually or you know somebody who has or you're supporting somebody who has maybe a partner or a work colleague. So we should be looking at um, improving that menopause education for everybody, not just for those that are going to experience it. And as a result of that, we've learned that actually there's no one way to fit everybody. Um, we know that there isn't a one size fits all. You can't just slot in um, an easy solution for this. Everybody's menopause is different. The way that we experience menopause is different. Every workplace is different. So it has to be flexible. And it's also the point for me to say that I do use the word women frequently when I'm talking about the menopause. Over 88 percent of people going through menopause will um, identify themselves as women. But we must not forget the non-binary trans men who may also experience the same symptoms and find it actually much harder to access the support that they need. And we think of the menopause as being physical um, and of course psychological symptoms occur as well. But actually it is a whole body um, health experience. The whole body experiences the lack of oestrogen after the menopause. And menopause often hits just at the same time that we're experiencing other things in life. So we talk about the sandwich generation, you know, we're looking after our children or our teenagers at the same time that we're looking after our elderly parents and having responsibilities outside the home and work and beyond just our own family. And so I think in a workplace, we have to consider it's not just the single moment in time that menopause experiences it occurs and the symptoms that accompany it, but also everything else that's going on, the midlife issues if you go through menopause at the usual time. So menopause is actually um, an important issue. I hope I've uh, described that to you. Um, but what actually is menopause? Just going to touch briefly so that we get the terminology of what we're describing, because in fact, the menopause itself is simply when your periods stop. And if that's all it was, it would not be a problem, most of us would be delighted to see the end of periods. This usually happens between 45 and 55, although it does vary in ethnic groups. And we know that if you're black or of South Asian origin, you may experience your menopause a bit sooner than, than 50, 51, which is described as the average age, um, but it's the average age for white women. Around one in 100 will experience menopause under the age of 40, uh, sometimes for medical reasons, sometimes for reasons that we just never discover and one in a thousand under 30. So if you're thinking of the stereotypical menopausal person as being female 50 with hot flushes and night sweats, it can be a long way from that. Um, and it's not easy, you can't identify the person um, that's going through menopause. Sometimes I'm asked, how, how long does it last? And you know, I wish I could give a clear answer to that. For some people, it won't, very, won't last very long at all, a few months and they're through the transition. But for others, the perimenopause, which is the time either side 
of your period stopping or the change or the menopause journey, whichever language you'd like to use to describe that period in time. It can last an average of five to seven years. And for a few women, it lasts much longer than that. The good thing is that not everybody gets all the symptoms and not everybody gets all the symptoms all the time. So we go in and out um, of symptoms. However, about three quarters of people do get menopausal symptoms and around a quarter of those will describe them as being moderate to severe, which means that they have to make adjustments either personally or at work or at home to accommodate the symptoms, which might be as simple as having a fan on the desk or moving the desk to somewhere that's a bit cooler. Could be as simple as that. For people with more complex symptoms and more long term symptoms and more troublesome symptoms, it may mean more, more uh, flexible adjustments, things like different starting times, ending times, choosing the time of day that you might be able to do your presentations, for example, or the day that you apply yourself to those jobs which need a greater concentration. Um, and women themselves usually know what those kind of adjustments might be. So I'm going to put this slide up. I'm not going to go through them individually, but just to remind you the type of symptoms that we're talking about. It's a whole array of symptoms that can happen around the perimenopause. And we can all identify probably that flushes and sweats are the most common. That feeling of intense heat takes you completely by surprise. They can happen two or three times a day. Or if you're really badly suffering, they can happen once or twice an hour. And they can happen at night, waking you up dreadfully at night as well. Those are the easy to identify symptoms, but some of these others you might not associate with menopause. Joint pains, palpitations, did you know that those are, are menopause type symptoms as well? And if you start having those things, what do you do? You start thinking there's something else wrong with you. You start exploring down the route of have I got arthritis? Have I got a heart problem? And so on. And it's only as you put together the jigsaw of all the symptoms um, and you realise and begin to understand that actually it's your hormones having the greatest impact on your health. And the physical symptoms, well, they're bad enough, aren't they? Um, but the emotional or psychological symptoms are the ones which actually um, bother people most at work. When we look at the surveys like the Fawcett Society survey, the CIPD surveys, it's these symptoms like brain fog, memory, concentration, which have the most effect at work. And you can begin to see under you can begin to understand why, can't you? Because it starts to make you feel as if maybe you're not as competent as you were, whereas you've still got all your skills and it's just harder to do the job. That can make you feel anxious. You start to worry that you're not doing the job to the best as you would like to do. Um, is, are you able to get those adjustments that you might need to be able to continue working to your fullest, fullest potential? The result of that is that you sometimes become quite inward looking. You don't always go for the promotions that you should. You don't necessarily increase your hours. You don't go for the senior leadership positions that you might have done otherwise because your confidence has been undermined. I'm just going to hold that slide there for a moment and wondered if anybody wanted to um, add anything or ask anything about symptoms. We've got a lot of comments, um, Kathy, saying that uh, people's lives have been affected, their confidence is really low. I mean, do you have any advice for for, for, for these? Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen this time and time again. I think the uh, physical effects of the menopause start to knock you emotionally and then that can lead to the anxiety and sometimes irritability as well. And I mean, irritability is an interesting symptom because we tend to not demonstrate that at work. We're pretty good, aren't we, at not getting irritated with people at work. But it's our family that bears the brunt of that, our partners and our children that bear the brunt of it. I think the confidence issue um, is partly one about being empowered to understand the symptoms and also to seek help for them. Um, and the people who I think probably get the worst deal are the ones who try to cover it up and don't seek help. It's very difficult or they don't recognise it. You know, sometimes they don't understand themselves because these psychological symptoms are often the first. They happen before you see any change in periods. Really good question here. Um, how do you differentiate between perimenopause and depression? Because GPs still don't fully understand it, do they? They just want to throw a load of antidepressants at you. Yeah, and I feel sorry for GPs because they have a, you know, it's really, really difficult to make a diagnosis in the five minutes or so that you're going to get with them. And on my own experience of coming alongside people at the menopause is that by the time people came to see me, and I was actually quite sympathetic and understanding. They were so much at the end of their tether that they would burst into tears, almost with relief. But then, you know, for the GPs, that makes them think, oh, dear, this person's depressed. 
and actually they're not necessarily clinically depressed. That's how things get misdiagnosed. You do get depression at the menopause though, and if you're somebody who has had hormonally linked depression in earlier life, so maybe you had postnatal depression, maybe you've had premenstrual depression, then the menopause can also tip you into another episode of depression, and that probably is best treated with clinical um, antidepressants. But the low mood, you know, there's just not no joy in life is how Lorraine Kelly described it. She just felt that there was no joy. Um, that's That can be menopause related. And I'd encourage people to start looking and putting the jigsaw together. You know, is it low mood and something else? Um, in which case it's worth seeking help specifically for the menopause. Any Thank other? you. Um, another question here. So can hair loss be a symptom or is does HRT cause this? So HRT seldom causes um, hair loss, although there are some um, testosterone type HRTs which may contribute to hair loss. Um, but hair loss can be a symptom of the menopause for a couple of reasons. First of all, your hormone levels are changing and will in, um, influence the thickness and quality of, of head hair but also your general health dictates the hair condition. So if you're under the weather because of menopause symptoms um, or you're having heavy periods, for example, and you're becoming anemic, um, or maybe you've got thyroid issues alongside it, then that also can contribute to hair loss. Is there light at the end of the tunnel? At the end of menopause, when it's over, do you get your energy and your, you know, does everything come back again? Yes, it does usually. And um, also most people aren't like this continually. So they'll go in and out of waves of these feelings. Um, but yes, most of the research shows that these symptoms that I've put up now are symptoms which when you come through the menopause, they go completely. So you go back to being who you were. Some of the symptoms um, such as um, vaginal dryness, bladder symptoms, they can be a bit more long term and they're harder sometimes without treatment. You, you know, I would suggest people get treatment for those. But if you take treatment for these, you're taking it for relief of symptoms during the transition. And then when the transition's finished and you come off treatment, um, if you choose to do that, then those symptoms should have gone. And is it um, is it good to take HRT uh, sooner, sooner rather than later, as soon as you start the sort of pe perimenopause stage? So I'm often asked this question, what, you know, is it too uh, is it ever too early to start HRT? It's never too early if your symptoms are due to the hormones. But sometimes if you're in your mid 40s, it's quite difficult to know whether it is actually the menopause that's causing your symptoms or is it the life stresses and the work stresses and everything else that's going on at the same time. That can be quite difficult and taking HRT is not going to change that. So it could be a little bit early for that. But if you've put together that jigsaw either on your own or um, with somebody else at Pepe, for example, our practitioners can come alongside you and help to put that jigsaw together and you put it together and it looks like perimenopause, then that's the time to, stay, to start thinking about HRT. So it's never too early. It's never too late. But you want to take it for the right reason. Thank you. So this is impacting individuals and we've heard from several of you today that this is really having an impact on individuals, but it's also affecting businesses because every individual is contributing to the business and if they're not functioning at their best, then they're not obviously working to their best potential for themselves as an individual, but also for you as a business. And we talked a little bit about brain fog and we know that the surveys um, that we've done in PEPI suggest that 65% of women experience brain fog. Now brain fog isn't a medical condition. Brain fog is something that women describe around the time of the menopause. And it refers to that feeling that just not having clarity of thought, not being able to pull out the words when you need to pull them out. So maybe you're in a meeting and you're waiting for your turn to speak. And then when your turn finally comes, you've lost thread of what you were wanting to say. That's um, brain fog. Or maybe you just don't have that memory recall as sharply and as quickly as you would have normally done. So you're walking down the corridor, for example, somebody comes towards you, you know who they are, but can you recall their name in the moment? It's gone. And that's brain fog as well. We see this at other times of hormonal dysfunction as well. We see it in pregnancy when people um, have what used to be called baby brain, pregnancy, brain fog. And we see it at the time of the menopause and it does pass. It does go when you come through. But that's obviously an issue for people who are working. And because it does cause such anxiety and because it does lead to such lack of confidence sometimes and physical symptoms that can't always be helped at work, 
Um, people do go off sick and they don't always tell you that it's due to the menopause. Not all organisations will have um, software, HR software, which will report menopause specifically. And um, the NHS, for example, now does. It has a, a category for sick leave, which is menopause related in the same way that um, everybody has pregnancy related sick leave. Um, so it goes down and it gets labelled as stress or women's problems. Um, and that's a problem because it means you can't measure in your workplace how many people are taking leave because of menopause. But also it means it's more difficult for women themselves to explain to their managers that that's the reason that they're going off sick. And sometimes they're going off sick, not because they want to be off sick, but just because they feel that they don't have the support at work in order to carry on. And we heard the statistic earlier um, that Ellie gave us about one in 10 women leaving work around the time of the menopause. Um, and actually one in four think about it. That's what the survey show is that with, for women with symptoms, um, and I guess this is a time to remember that about a quarter of women don't have symptoms at all. But of those that do, about one in four seriously consider leaving their work or downsizing or not going for um, promotion as well. So that's an issue too, particularly if you're trying to retain senior female staff. And we know from the um, ONS data that women of menopausal age, which is roughly around 50, if we could take it as being the normal age or a natural age, we make up the fastest growing demographic of the UK workforce. You know, the days when we used to retire at um, 60 have gone. I mean, I look back to my mum, she retired at 60 um, and she's a totally different situation to me. You know, women now don't necessarily have a partner supporting them. They are one of the partners supporting each other or they're a sole breadwinner. Children, we're having children later, so we've got younger children still as we get into our 50s and 60s. And of course, the government has very kindly said we've got to continue working at least until 67, and it looks like it's going to be 70 plus. So we are staying in the workforce much longer. So what can we do about it? What sort of things can we put in place? Well, I think the first thing is to say that as individuals, I firmly believe that we should be um, able to access good NHS support. Um, but sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes we need more than that. Um, and sometimes the accessibility to support as an individual is not useful. But what about companies? What can they do? These are some of the things which I would say are steps that you can put in place as an organisation. First of all is just think about whether the word menopause and the whole menopause conversation is appropriate in your workplace. Is it something that people are happy to mention and happy to talk about? And if not, we need to build on that. We need to make it so that it's not something that people laugh about and joke about. It might mean appointing a menopause champion, somebody to just point things out and to be approachable by people who have help. Ask your staff, send out a survey to your teams um, and just try and identify whether or not they feel that the workplace culture is one where menopause is easy to discuss. And remembering that it's not just those who are going to experience menopause that we need to talk to, it's everybody. So thinking about line managers in particular, many line managers really, really want to help. But if they've not gone through menopause themselves or they're not likely to go through menopause, they may have very little understanding. Um, and that's absolutely OK. You know, nobody teaches us what to expect at menopause. So I think this is something where workplaces can step in. They can do education to um, teams and to line managers. And then finally, I think it's great that we're talking about it. It's great that we have the understanding that it's OK to uh, talk to your manager about it. But then the next question is, well, what then? Because the next step has to be to offer tangible personalised support. And that might start with um, a resource page on your website. It may be offering support services. It may be using an EAP, for example. But there has to be that final step of actually making things change for the individual. So I think that there's a few things that I'd say here. The first is that um, peer to peer support is great. And I love the idea of menopause cafes. Many, many organisations have these now and they are a real opportunity for people to understand that there's other people in my workplace like me. But as my healthcare professional hat on, I don't think that the peer to peer networks are the place to get medical advice and medical support. So you need to have um, expert advice accessible as well as the peer to peer support. And of course, meetings at work are great. Coffee room chats are great, but we don't all work in offices. It needs to be accessible remotely as well so that whether people are a hybrid or in the office, they can still access the support and information. And I think people want to access support in different ways. For many people, the one to one PEPI consultation, for example, um, that we that we offer um, through our organisation, it's exactly what people want. They want to talk to a menopause practitioner, hone in on their personal 
circumstances, their medical history and, and get what they need. Other people would rather dip in and out, learn a little bit about resources and um, just do their own homework a little bit. And that needs to be evidence based as well. So I'm going to hand over to Molly. She's going to tell you a little bit about our service and I'll still be here for any questions. Do you want to stop for any questions now, Ellie, from that point of view, the menopause side? Um, just one question, actually. How do you do you have any tips for breaking a work? Well, improving a workplace culture to make it a bit more welcoming. You you, you mentioned that, you know, some people might be giggling or, you know, if you have a male heavy senior leadership team, how, how do you begin the conversation or try to encourage people to start talking about it? I think um, for the higher up the organisation, the conversation starts, the better. And I think if you can have a senior leadership ally to um, prompt this conversation, that's really, really useful. But also, I think um, we need to recognise that we need our male colleagues to be allies in this as well. So if you can get somebody to join the groups and to represent uh, men in the organisation during these conversations, I think that helps. And I think um, you start with the women's groups, you start with the networks, but then you incorporate menopause into everything that the company's doing. So, for example, all of the mandatory training uh, that you'd be expected to do, you can slot menopause into that, whether it's manual handling, health and safety, diversity, equality. Um, menopause fits in all of those. It should just be a natural part of conversation is what I'd say. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Um, that was really insightful and it's really great to see all of the comments coming in, all of the questions around this. And I'm, I'm sure for any of those unanswer unanswered questions, we can come to those at the end as part of the Q&A. Um, but for the next 10 minutes, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of who we are at Pepe and what we do. Um, so this slide really illustrates the reason that we exist at Pepe, and that's because there are critical areas of employee well-being that remain overlooked. And that's not just in workplace provision, um, but as Kathy's alluded to, sadly, it's also by the NHS, just given how overwhelmed they are. And these are topics that, you know, really for too long have been taboo in the workplace. And um, PEPI exists to address them with meaningful and inclusive support. So these are the areas um, that we cover. It's not just menopause, it's also fertility, um, men's health, women's health, and also um, pregnancy and parenthood. And the reason that we focused on these areas is because they are significantly impacting people at work. And we've heard some of the statistics already for menopause. And this is a further snapshot of the problem. So we see lots of stats here that tie into mental health, impacting on engagement and productivity, um, absenteeism, attrition, you know, the gender pay gap. All of these topics are hitting your businesses uh, culturally and commercially. And Pepe strives to make sure that these topics are not taboo. They're very much on the table and employers have meaningful support for those who need it. If you just go on to the next slide, please, Kathy. Thank you. Um, and so, again, these are the areas of specialism that we cover. Um, and you can see here the types of topics that we cover within each of these areas. So menopause, for example, um, our support is really a 360 look at menopause. So what is it? You know, awareness, perimenopause, what symptoms are there? Clearly, there are many. Uh, how can I manage those symptoms? What, what treatment options are available to support people? Right through to um, a PEPI uh, a menopause practitioner who will be registered by the British Menopause Society, um, being able to provide the user directly with, with HRT prescription and advice on, on prescription as well. Um, we cover the other areas that you can see. So, for example, fertility, which is deliberately broad. You know, it means anyone considering conceiving, as well as those who might be actively struggling or going through really difficult times, such as miscarriage or loss. Um, and again, through to those uh, who, who need treatment. Then men's health. Um, we've talked a bit about men today. Um, clearly, we know there's all there's there's a lot of health inequalities that exist for women, but there's a completely different set that exists for men. One in five men will die before the age of retirement and 50 percent of those deaths are preventable. Um, we know that men tend to go to their GP less. They tend to take control um, of their health a bit less. So we look at all of those underserved areas of, of male health as well. Things like urology, hormonal, sexual health um, and all of the lifestyle factors as well that do tie into that those poor health outcomes that we see for men. 
And then women's health, um, of course, outside of menopause and fertility or, or pregnancy and parenthood, there are many underserved areas of women's health as well. So things like endometriosis and um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, vaginal health, menstrual health, you know, topics which are clearly taboo in the workplace, but we know are impacting women. And then finally, we support um, your pregnant employees and um, support for new parents as well. So the first uh, two years of parenthood. Um, and that's where we often find people are feeling at their most vulnerable. We get lots of questions here around feeding and sleep and, and what's normal and what's not. All of our services are fully inclusive, whatever your gender identity, whatever your sexual orientation, whatever your ethnicity. Um, and we have experts who are well versed in, in dealing with all of those different specialisms. And underpinning all of these areas, we provide additional support in the way of LGBTQ plus specialists, mental health experts, weight management, nutritionists, dietitians, um, et cetera, to support everyone um, as they go through these healthcare journeys. And when we make PEPI available in an organisation, we make it available for everyone. So we um, include all employees and we include partners as well as part of the service. And this is what it is. So our service is delivered on an app, but it's about connecting your people to real experts in their area of specialism. So you download our app, you fill in a questionnaire, um, and from there you land on a highly personalised homepage on the app, and you're able to engage your peppy in a number of different ways. Uh, the first is one-to-one -one expert support. And this is where we provide valuable and comfortable interactions with our one-to-one -one experts. Um, sorry, with our with our um, experts on a one-to-one -one basis. We do this through chat, which is very much like WhatsApp. You drop a message, you get a real-life response, um, and you can also have unlimited video consultations with a practitioner. So that would be a menopause practitioner, maybe, or um, you know, fertility nurse practitioner. So all legally registered to practice healthcare. Um, in the UK and governed by the relevant governing body. So obviously, if you go to your GP today, very difficult to get an appointment with a specialist with Pepe. You can just have that expert in your pocket and have unlimited access to them. Um, then we also do group supports, um, so, so group chats and support groups. Um, and we also have several events every day in the app, things like getting started with breastfeeding or, you know, recovering from a traumatic birth, HRT or not HRT. So insightful, well-attended events, which are led by leading experts. And then finally, PEPI is a single source of scientifically sound, clinically backed content. Um, so we have over 4,000 articles, video series, audio series, well-being courses. You know, maybe you're looking at HRT, you don't want to Google what you think you need to know. And actually it's helpful to be guided through a course which has been curated by experts in their field on that topic. And we also include um, a number of clinical tests as well, which are all sent to the user's home. Um, again, completely included in the cost, um, no additional cost. And, and, and we do prescriptions as well, prescriptions across um, a number of our services. Um, we're lucky enough to be working with over 350 leading employers. Um, currently over 3 million people have access to Pepe. Um, we work globally. Um, and you can see here many different um, sectors that we're working with, whether it's law firms or, you know, retail, um, whether it's consultancies. And I think the fact that we're providing healthcare services to the National Healthcare Service, so really proud to, to work with the NHS. Um, and we're currently working with 19 of their trusts and we're one of the few employee, employee benefits to be offered by the NHS. So it's a huge source of pride for us. And the feedback that we get from these employers is um, outstanding. So, you know, Aviva here saying, you know, it, it may not be a service that all of our colleagues will use, but it's life changing for those that do. Santander saying Pepe is for everyone. For us, it truly spans all genders and supports far reaching issues. And Wix saying, you know, whether you're the CEO or a lorry driver in their distribution centre, you get that same access to Pepe. And that was really important to Wix to be able to provide equitable healthcare to their total workforce. And the reason that the feedback is so 
brilliant is because it, it really works. Um, and this is just one example. You know, we have tons of case studies and testimonials, but just um, looking here at the incredible um, engagement and adoption that we that we're able to achieve. So 79 percent of our users actively use our chat functionality to communicate with practitioners. 90% said that they felt more positive about Santander in this case. And um, this was this was um, a case study from Santander. Um, felt more positive about them as an employer as a result of offering Pepe. 94% said that they'd recommend us to a friend. And 76% said that their menopause symptoms had improved and that they felt more confident on their menopause journey. And this is measured on the menopause rating scale. So it's NHS accredited data. So you can trust that, you know, this kind of support really does work um, and make, make a clinical difference. And I think this is my final slide and, um, you know, it's just the best part of what we do. We get this kind of feedback on a daily basis. We have an internal Slack channel that, that shares um, feedback with permission, which is all anonymized, of course. And yeah, we just hear this this kind of thing, um, you know, on a on a t every 10 minutes, basically. And it's people saying, Peppy's changed my life. Um, you know, I would have had less time off sick if I'd had Peppy. Um, I, I, you know, I would have stayed at my employer. We were constantly hearing this kind of feedback um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And our net promoter score is currently 75, which is um, world-class. Uh, and yeah, if anyone knows anything about net promoter scores, zero is, um, is you know, anything above zero is positive. I think Apple are in the 40s. So having a net promoter score that high is, um, again, a big source of pride for us. Um, so I hope that was helpful. We'll be sharing the slides um, with Illit to circulate and along with our contact details. Uh, but I think we've got a bit of time now just to go to the, the Q&A. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Cathy. Are there any extra questions that anyone has? It's been a really thorough session, actually. Really, really, really useful. We don't have any questions, so we we might just be able to wrap, wrap this up. And as Molly said, we will share the recording afterwards and everyone that didn't have a chance to join will also send it to them too. And we'll also include um, Molly's contact details in case anyone would like any extra information about Pepe and how, how to introduce it into their workplace. So all that's left to say is a big massive thank you to, to Kathy and Molly. Thanks very much.